oh, the secondhand cringe of even remembering a, like a handful of those exchanges. Capitalism. If you don't want to live there anymore, don't use its language. <laughs> and welcome back to my channel. My name's Lena and I talk about all sorts of stuff in a similarly chaotic way to the way this video is going to be structured, probably. Yes, thank you. The micro, <laughs> micro fringe and me are doing well. We're still in the honeymoon stage, but I think, I think we have something. If you're wondering why I have a fringe, there's a video about that up here. You might know that on my channel I have this series called The 20s Toolkit. I've just turned 30 and it's my Mary Poppins bag of assorted tools and objects of things that either I worked out during my 20s or I wish I'd worked out during my 20s. This list is a combination of both. I had jobs since I was like 16, although I mean maybe eight if you count my ball breaking eight year old wedding choir hustling. Three pound a wedding! I was rich. Anyway, but it was only really in my 20s that I moved to a big city. I moved from being a cleaner and working behind a bar to having to interact with serious people in offices and mix with lots of different people and lots of different situations that I wasn't familiar with before. I had the language of a teenager from the Midlands who grew up during the 90s and I slowly adjusted that and that's okay. Sometimes it's a revolution, sometimes it's an evolution. I guess the point I'm trying to communicate is that your 20s is a time not only to situate yourself in the decade that you're actually living in and not the decade you grew up in but it's also a time to practice that because we're gonna keep needing to do that every decade henceforth up until we die or the earth does so i think not only adjusting your language but learning how to open your mind to adjusting your language is a really healthy thing attitudes and the phrases we attach to them are always adjusting and this is a kind of mixture of just things that are just embarrassing that i said or i've heard people say and things that are like genuinely can cause harm and like while the whole free speech thing is a whole other debate I just think, why do you wanna die on the altar of inconsequential phrases that you say every day that could potentially have a magnitude of real world effects on people's lives when they're just throwaway things that you say? They don't matter to you. It's like arguing the design layout and format of your crisp packet in your meal deal versus like someone's actual experience and feelings and like a huge thing in theirs. Like, why would you, why would you die? Why, why is that the hill you wanna die on? So anyway, today we are not dying on hills. <laughs> So the first one isn't that deep, it's actually kind of just a tactic that I started implementing as soon as I realised the problem. And the problem is the phrase, nice to meet you. This is fine, you can say this to anyone as long as you're sure that you have actually never met them before. Mm. I have worked in the publishing industry for like eight or nine years now. After about year one, of being in this industry. There was already so much overlap between people I was meeting and like parties I'd be at and people I'd have worked with in one company or win on one project and then not. And if you're somebody like me that has, I have very little spatial awareness and I think that feeds also into like um, registering the stuff that's in front of me really fast. So sometimes I'll recognize somebody's face, but then I'll think, Lena, you just think that everybody looks friendly. You think you know everybody because you think you live in a tiny village in your head. You don't know this person. You just think that everybody looks familiar. And then I'll introduce myself to this person and they'll be like, yeah, we've already met. <laughs> Oh, the secondhand cringe of even remembering a, like a handful of those exchanges. It's not because I don't care or I don't try and like store people in my mind. It's usually that I remember their names and I remember like a conversation with that we've had like over their face or their face in a different context to the office or situation that I'm in disorientates me a little bit and I hyperventilate. So I have now eradicated the phrase, nice to meet you from my vocabulary completely. You will not hear me say that phrase because it's got me into enough trouble and I really like the phrase, nice to see you. It's neutral. I could be talking to my mother, the person who birthed me out of their womb, or I could be talking to a stranger on the street. It's nice to see you. How welcoming is that? How nice to think you come from a world where people are just happy to see you and it doesn't matter if it's a first exchange or a last exchange, you're just a pleasant person to be exchanging words with. Trust me, it's way less formal, it sounds nicer, and it'll get you out of so much trouble if you have a face colander in your mind that just loses faces. And it's not that everybody, it's not that I don't remember faces, it's that everybody looks familiar to me in some way and I, I don't know why. <laughs> 
Buy yourself back from automatically saying he or she when you first learn about somebody's existence. This can often happen in a work context where they could be like, Alex from IT wants to come down and look at our computers. Or I was speaking to Joe from this agency that we work with. Often my brainwashed gender normative brain will assign a gender to that person. And this isn't only beneficial when we want to be inclusive of the trans community and people who are non-binary and all the ways we have learned that people are made to feel uncomfortable in this world by this like invented system we call gender, but also because there are so many gender neutral names like Joe and like Alex that I realized because of my brainwashed brain, I was assigning a gender to depending on the kind of job they did. And that's me. I'm the, supposed to be the feminist, I'm the shittest feminist in the world. <laughs> if they were a PR person, I would assume they were a she. If they were an editor, I would assume they were a he. And that is really embarrassing. <laughs> and by changing my referral to people before I know their pronouns as they, I normalize not knowing. And I think by integrating that kind of language into our everyday, it actually does adjust our thoughts a little bit. I do think that the words we use solidify assumptions that we have at the back of our head that we don't realize we're doing. And I, I still do this when I refer to nurses. <laughs> I'm always like, oh, what's oh, you saw a nurse? What did she say? Because for some reason in my mind, when I think nurse, I see this woman. That's not okay. That's not, it's not, it's just not accurate. So anyway, that's one of the things that I consciously started doing in my twenties to be like, it is not the 1640s anymore. We need to redecorate my brain. It still had really peeling old wallpaper that I was just like, do you know what? New era, new lick of paint. Number three, capitalism. If you don't want to live there anymore, don't use its language. We need to eradicate the phrase, what do you do from normal initial interactions with people. I have this at parties and weddings and places where you're trying to learn about somebody or learn like how you're gonna connect with them or like what thing you have in common that you can talk about. But we're often intercepting people's paths at various different points in their lives. And I think there's a lot of pain around jobs around how you support yourself, how you make money. And that can be quite immediate. And I definitely have had like the most heartbreak and the most emotional turmoil in my life because of jobs, not because of family really, or even, even relationships. There are way more books and like frameworks to hang my anguish off when it came to, to breakups. Anyway, what I'm saying is if you had a few at a wedding and you wanna find somebody to chat to, somebody might not wanna talk about how they've just been made redundant or how they qualified in this one thing but they could never find a job in it and ultimately they had to choose a different kind of path to happiness than the one that they were passionate about. So when they say they professionally insure drain pipes, that doesn't mean all of the things that they're scared you might assume about them because they insure drain pipes. Maybe your passion is insuring drain pipes, I don't know. Oh, dead leg, oh my God, it's the devil telling me to stop judging drain pipe insurers. Oh, 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 that was a lot. Okay, the point is people aren't what they do and people might have found other things to make their lives fulfilling than the thing that you think isn't fulfilling in their life or something. In the past, when I've asked somebody, oh, what do you do? Or like, what's your job? Um, what I'm really asking is, what interests you? What fills your life up? Tell me about something you care about. And that's because I'm living in a utopia in my head that in fact, for most of my twenties, I didn't live in myself, where people get to do their passions as their career, where people have easy career paths, regardless of their class, gender, or race. Going back into the position that gave me dead leg because I never know what's good for me. So if you want to know the answer to those questions, why not ask those questions? Yeah, it might sound a bit topless Russell Brand at the end of his career talking about Buddhism, but sometimes we all need to be Russell Brand at the end. It's better than being Russell Brand at the beginning of his career at a party. I've been trying phrases like, "How how's your day? How would you score your day on a, on a rate of one to 10? Which usually makes people laugh or at least like kind of give, people give me the sympathy laugh. And then I'm like, no, really tell me out of, out of 10. And then they're like six. And I'm like, oh, what, 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 did, what did you lose points for? And they'll be like, oh, I missed the bus. And I'll be like, oh, buses. But you can literally just be like, Bill, Nice to see you. What's your favorite conversation topic? <laughs> or I was gonna ask you what your job was, but I realized that's a reductive question. What do you like talking about? <laughs> Have you ever thought about death? 
What did you want to be when you grew up? Have you ever thought about how your dreams and aspirations line up with your carbon footprint and how sustainable your pension will be in a world where banks may not exist? <laughs> you know, just things to stir the pot. You'll at least know each other better afterwards. Here's another one that, that for me came up a lot because I live in London, but I'm also sure is applicable to lots of places that you may live. Um, but the phrase up and coming area. It's a really like, I used to use that because I was parroting other people. But when I sat down and thought about it, I was like, what is an up and coming area? Like, when was it down and out? Essentially the subtext that you might accidentally be kind of saying when you say it's an up and coming area is like, oh, it used to be full of poor people and it made me feel dangerous personally as a person of privilege. But now I feel more comfortable because the racial makeup of the area has become more white and it has branches of capitalist chain shops that I really have developed a pseudo social attachment to. So I'm excited to move there. The topic of gentrification is some, isn't some something that I can either tackle or isn't something that I'm not completely innocent from. I've definitely moved to areas that I know have been gentrified at some point in time. I actually found a really great girl who does like loads of really good video essays on class that I'm gonna leave below. And she did a really great one on gentrification. Um, but it's just like, I think that we need to find more words to say, it's an area that I'd like to live in. <laughs> Or like, oh, it sounds nice there. Why does it have to be about what it previously was and why that was either good or bad? Here's another one that I've been thinking more about recently. And it's weird that I hear this phrase a lot, considering I live in Britain, but like African-American to refer to somebody's race, somebody's ethnicity, how they, how we are assuming they identify when we don't, we're not in America. And often the person doesn't have an American accent and has never indicated they, that they could be in any way American. And why are we talking about their race anyway so soon into not knowing them and maybe in third person? Absorbing media from all around the world is really cool and really important and really amazing. But remembering that you're using it in a real life geographical location that you actually 3D live in and can considering how useful some phrases you've learned on the internet might be to the people that you're at that are actually in front of you is really important and it is so weird that I've when I think about it I have overheard and like been said this phrase at me quite a lot when I was in my 20s was referring to people as African-American when they're people that exist in Britain and there have been black people in Britain for like hundreds if not thousands of years <laughs> you can't really look at somebody at all and know how they identify or what their ethnic origin is so like questioning why you even need to refer to it anyway is another thing i've heard people be like so i met this black guy at a bar and i'm like waiting for the black bit to be relevant and then it never is i used to work with this african-american guy called matt oh that's amazing like what part of america did he grow up in and they're like oh no he's from brixton <laughs> And then also the assumption that even if somebody has emigrated from another place or their family might have at some point emigrated from another place, it, Africa isn't, you, they could be from, they could be from a, a range of places, including the Caribbean that wouldn't technically be Africa. I'm not gonna labor the point, but it's just something that I've overheard. And now I'm trying to, instead of just be like, that was a weird moment, try and like actually correct and be like, oh, like, what do you mean? Like, why, what do you mean? <laughs> Here's one that like is for me something that I am still trying to change in my head because I grew up in the 90s uh, and we talked about climate change. We talked about losing fossil fuels, things are changing, the climate is changing. And to be honest, given that we're still in a really dire place and barely anything has changed, it seems that language was a little too soft and might have been completely diluted. You may not know that I have a series on my channel called A Guide to Positive Panic and it's all about the climate crisis. You can watch it up here. But since I've been working more on it and about my knowledge about it and stuff, I've been really consciously shifting the phrase climate change to climate crisis because it's an accurate phrase and i think sometimes when we talk about climate change and you've learned about it as a kid or you've kind of like it's just been like one of the subjects that you studied at school it can become very background and like frankly the only way that we're going to be able to exist to say all these nice phrases to each other in this video in the future is if we sort that out. So it's kind of the least, it's the one I'm gonna explain the least in this video, but it's actually probably the most important one because without it, all of the other changes that you make will have real world like immediate impact, but will like eventually become redundant because 
No nice to see you on a dead planet. Why do I always have to be the Debbie Downer in this? Another one that I learned in my 20s that I had to train myself out of really consciously was automatically asking or referring to people's parents. Throughout my 20s, um, close people to me either lost parents or were really traumatically estranged from them. And this idea of the nuclear family and the fact that you have one mum and one dad and everything is good from there on out and that they're a mum and dad at all and not a dad and a dad and not a mum and a mum. Just like had permeated my language and my default way of thinking about other people's lives in this way that's just inaccurate. Like it's so, it's such an unnecessary question for me to ask or assume. And for them, it's such a big thing to open up at unpredictable and unexpected moments that like, why? Why open that chasm right now for no reason? Just because you want to ask about somebody's Christmas plans. <laughs> okay, Google, what's the time? almost lunch. I've got more, nine more minutes with you guys and then I'm gonna get my jacket potato. There's lots of different like family holidays or like referring to your home, your house, where, where you grew up or where you live um, that can include phrases like, oh, what were your mum and dad like? Or what are your parents' names? In these kind of casual ways that like, you might not have the kind of social contract with that person where they are gonna open up to you about how complicated their home life is and like waiting for them to voluntarily give you that information is way better for everyone involved. But like, I'm gonna use Christmas as an example, but it could also be stuff like, what does your mom think about your tattoos? Did your mom always do this growing up? Um, but for Christmas, it could be something like, who do you usually spend Christmas with? Or who has won the lottery and gets to spend Christmas with you then? Come on, where are you going? What What's happening? And also even this is a completely different point, but like, why do we assume that people are celebrating Christmas? Maybe say, are you a Christmas kind of person? And that could either be met with like, Oh yeah, my family celebrate Christmas, but I'm not really into, I don't know, Jesus. Uh, or it could be like, oh no, actually I celebrate this completely different holiday. But usually during this Christmas period, I go and visit these people. Again, it's such a small adjustment and it's something that I didn't realize was causing harm until there were some situations where I definitely did cause harm or at least caused people to have to volunteer information that I probably hadn't really earned. Also, one of my closest friends lost uh, his mum during the time of the your mum jokes. And it was, it's just, a, it was just a minefield. So like, I'm happy for shell suits to return. I'm happy. I'm happy for the Tamagotchis to come back, especially if they're solar paneled, but like we can leave the joke, your mum, like let's just seal the door around that and leave it very much in 1999, please. <laughs> On a lighter note, um, something that I would just like people to stop saying at me, <laughs> um, but I also realized that I've said at other people a lot is like, oh, you have got to watch this thing. You have got to, like you have, like, have you watched it? Oh my God. Well, I'm not gonna tell you anything about it, but like you have, like, it's just so, I can't even find the word. It's just, and then that conversation goes on for like 10 minutes and you're not given any data on which to base your actual decision about whether you should watch the thing. You're just being thrown a lot of emotions out of context and without much, like the whole point for me in talking about books and films and TV we've watched is to learn more about the person I'm talking about the thing with. Not, it's not really about the thing. If you've seen something and I haven't seen it yet, uh, I'm way more interested in hearing about how you reacted to it, why you felt it was good and what it made you think about. What did it relate in your life to? What did it remind you of from your past? Like so, inter so down for those conversations. Um, but like, I feel like in this era where there's just so much to consume and it's so hard to prioritize the things that are actually important to us and honing how unique those things might be and how they're not what everybody else might be doing. Um, being assigned mandatory homework by people that aren't your closest people is just very stressful. <laughs> Like you don't know what people are trying to do with their lives at that point. You don't know how much time they have. Like it could be from a really deep privilege perspective. You don't know how many jobs that person has. You don't know how many kids they have and how, who, if they're getting any help with childcare, you don't know if they're really struggling with their mental health and TV isn't great for them right now. But even on a more superficial level, like they might just be trying to teach themselves cello in their rooms and that's just what their priority is. Don't tempt them away. Unless you've got a great Netflix show about cellos. I think it's cooler to just be like, either give a tailored recommendation, like, oh my God, I, I think that you'd love this because 
here is some stuff I know about you. So specifically, here's a pitch about why that would work for you. Kind of like being, a, I used to be a press officer. I wouldn't be able to just email anybody at the newspaper and be like, I think you should cover this book because it's great. I should be like, here's why it's specifically new information. And I think you and your column or your radio show would really benefit from this because it taps into your specific audience in this way. So in the same way, you need to pitch things to people if you really want to recommend stuff to them with care. Or you can just be like, I oh, don't know if you'd like it, but if you like this kind of stuff and if you want to think more about this and if you like the way stuff is directed like this, then maybe it might be for you. I don't know, that's up to you. But I really enjoyed it for these reasons. Like, it's almost, maybe it comes from a place of humility and it's like more like you want to be like, I enjoyed a thing and I want to share it and I'm sure you don't want to hear every, all of my thoughts about it, but I want you to have it. That's such a nice thought, but I want to hear about you. I like you. You're a person I'm spending time with. I give you permission to tell me the huge backstory about you and why you love it because your story and how it relates to this random TV show you saw is as important as the TV show itself. You are the person bringing value to the conversation, not Phoebe Wallerbridge. Although she brings a lot of value to most situations. Maybe if you do this, it's a self-esteem issue. Like maybe that's what it is. But I just think that people have enough homework. I guess the exception to this, if it's something that is about um, a political topic or a social topic that you really believe that people need to learn more about, like race or the climate crisis and stuff. So still tailoring it, but I get why that would be a more important piece of homework to set somebody. But think about your positioning to the person before I guess it's like judging, I'm kind of talking myself out of this comment now. I guess it's about judging the situation and judging like really how important or how much you think the, the TV show or the thing would add to somebody's life like genuinely or how it might add to the world, genuinely. And that's for you to judge my friends, good luck. <laughs> Another boundary one is probably, are you free on X day at X day? time what are you doing on thursday i don't know jeff what do you want me to do on thursday are you free on wednesday without telling somebody what the thing is that they might be invited to on wednesday people aren't just managing and this is something that i used to actually do because i thought that that's what i was supposed to do in my early 20s was people aren't just managing like it's not like school where it's like a free period an empty period a free period an empty period it's like people have like a certain amount of tasks and a certain amount of self-care and like rest that they need in the week and not all of that has fixed booked times but it's up to every person to balance their week rattle it see if there's any room inside it hear what the offering is of the thing that you might want to do and then see whether that should be prioritized over sleep or freelance work or spending time with their family and whether the favor you're asking of them or the random thing you want them to do for you is as important as that and god i'm being bitchy today is this bitchy oh, i don't think so i think it's just boundary setting it's much more like um polite and respectful to say here's the whole proposal i've got this thing it's probably going to involve this amount of time it's gonna be in this location. Is that something that would fit into your day? Fit into your week? Is that something that you'd be up for? Is Does that something that interests you? You're giving the power to them, especially if you're asking for a favor, rather than being like, are you free on Tuesday? And I say, yes. And you're like, great. I'd like you to help me move house because I'm too tight to book a van. <laughs> Saying no or withdrawing yourself from a situation like that is way, is make, puts all the emotional labor on them and makes them have to do all the work to get out of that. And Jim, don't you want excited, consensual, jubilated people involved in your idea and your thing that day on Wednesday, rather than people you've emotionally kidnapped? <laughs> so anyway, I have stopped saying, are you free on Tuesday? Because free is a movable concept essentially. I don't know why I'm getting so annoyed about this. This is one that I don't really need to unpack that much with you guys because I think we've talked about weight a lot. In fact, I should make a play. There's probably, I'm going to make a playlist of all the videos that I've made about weight and bodies up here. Saying 
you're looking well when somebody has lost weight. Um, it's not really, I don't see it as uh, bad or malicious and there have been times that I fluctuated my weight in my life and people have said that to me and it has made me feel good. But ultimately I know that it feeds into like an inaccurate assessment of health and how we see each other and it's something that I'm not mad about but I'm also like I'm trying to phase out for myself and we should probably all move away from that assumption because of said things in said videos up here. Instead, try stuff like... Actually, no, don't try, just want to go comment. Like, what's going on with you? What have you been filling your life with? Like, and maybe they'll be like, oh, actually, I've just discovered that I'm really into free running and I've been jumping over steeples and abandoned warehouses all week. Or, oh, well, actually, now you ask, my toaster broke, so I've been cut off from my Pop-Tarts addiction and that's very annoying. And I'm waiting for my Amazon Prime delivery of my new toaster any day. So I will intentionally be putting on any pounds you see that I've lost very soon. How embarrassing that I haven't been able to eat the amount of Pop-Tarts that my soul is owed. Or, <laughs> actually, I've been having a really shit time recently and I've been having trouble sleeping, I've been having trouble eating. And then you can talk about the thing that might be bothering them rather than having to comment on the fact that you've seen that they have lost some weight. And also losing weight's a weird phrase in general. Where did you lose it? Is it down the back of the sofa? Did you leave it on the bus? The last one and the one that annoys me the most. <sighs> When you have children, we'll be telling our grandchildren about this. Oh, on a superficial level, this is just a very historic thing that we assume about people now. It's particularly said to women and it's very annoying. <laughs> For me, it's just annoying because I really don't want to have children and I don't want to like talk about why with random strangers that I've only just met or I might be chatting to at a wedding or, um, it's just a bit of a Debbie Downer when, when like somebody asks you like, why don't you want to have children? It's like, or ultimately I don't know if I'm that much of a giving person and I feel no deep inherent calling for it and I believe that every child should be wanted ideally and I also think that maybe the cl climate crisis and the fact that we're all going to be underwater in like a hundred years means that anybody who doesn't enthusiastically want children definitely shouldn't. <laughs> it's going to change the flavour of the conversation. <laughs> And I don't always want to do that with some, I don't think that you want that, I don't want that. So for me, it's something that's very gendered and like a little bit insulting coming from a man. It's usually coming from a man. Having to contradict them feels like you have to explain like your whole backstory, uh, but then just nodding along with it feels like you're not being true to yourself and that you're kind of like having to lie to them a bit. But that is like a very 0 0.5 world privileged me reason. There are lots of deeper reasons that are like incredibly more complex and incredibly more hurtful and that is, the amount of miscarriages that happen in the UK, the amount of people that are infertile and don't want to be, the amount of people who are currently going through IVF, the amount of people who are struggling to conceive, the amount of people that aren't in a traditional heteronormative relationship and are trying to adopt, but the system keeps stopping them. Like there is a lot of trauma attached to um, being in charge of little humans. It is a question that we should ask and learn about people when we're getting to know them, but it's not a casual, it's not a casual throw in assumption. It's not a casual thing to talk about. Instead, you can try the next generation are gonna kill us for this, because <laughs> they will. Or when you meet a kid and you're in your eighties, you're gonna laugh and tell them this story. Just say meet a kid. Everybody meets kids. I have ideas about how we can all look after children in the future without having to biologically reproduce them. There's a video about that up here. Also, side note, but doesn't deserve its its own point. Um, don't argue with somebody who says that they don't want children when you don't know them very well. It's very weird. And also what I've got a few times is people being like, but you should have children because you're clever or you're one of the good ones or you're kind so you should have children. I, if I have to unpack why that's like utterly ridiculous and kind of like incredibly worrying on a lot of levels then I will, just not in this video. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this video. My impulse as a woman is to apologize for being in any way rude or too much or over irritated or potentially even <gasps> angry in this video, but I'm going to restrain myself from doing that and just say thank you for watching. Um, if you liked this video, I have a whole series about being in your twenties. It covers relationships and jobs and food and all sorts. So you can see that up here. Subscribing is a good way to find yourself here again by accident or on purpose. YouTube thinks you'll like this video 
video. And a big thank you to The Gumption Club who make these videos possible. They tip me per video so that you can watch them and adjust your language for free. Comment below adding your own thoughts on things that we should stop saying and what we could say instead. And if I've got anything wrong in this video, please continue my education in the comments too. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, frog snug out.